morning. Um, meat. Yeah. Right? It's really good, I know. But we eat far too much of it. Um, last year in Holland, we ate a kilo of meat less than the, uh, less than the year before, but still 76.3 kilos. Um, it's not as bad as in the US or Australia, Argentina, to name a few big consumers, but still 76.3 kilos, that's roughly 100,000 young cows, 6.5 million pigs, 170 million chickens, and then some. To produce this much meat, we have to raise um, chickens in drawers. We have to confine sows to farrowing crates so they don't crush their piglets. Not because it's typical for a sow to crush piglets, but allowing them the space not to crush their piglets would make your meat more expensive. Um, to produce this much meat, we raise genetically modified Frankenstein chickens whose breasts grow so much faster than their bones that they cannot support themselves. Now, these sick, def uh, deformed chickens, they live their short and miserable lives in their own and each other's shit. So we pump them full of antibiotics to keep them alive just long enough for us to kill them. And in the average case of a KFC chicken, that's just 35 days. Um, then there's the environment. A recent scientific study found that um, livestock production is the single largest driver of habitat loss. And Jonathan Safran Foer, he calculated that in the US, all farm animals produce 40,000 kilos of shit per second. Now, I cannot even imagine what that looks like. <laughs> But, I mean, and, and, and we're not only talking about manure. The typical waste stream of a U.S. farm consists of all these um, things. And with these literal shitloads of toxic waste, we pollute um, rivers, groundwater, soil, even the air. So take your pick. Animal cruelty, the environment, public health, whichever you find important, factory farming is outright criminal. Um, That's quite unsettling. But today's theme is not state the problem, it's be the cure. So what I could do is I could urge you to stop eating meat altogether. It's the most efficient and, and, and probably the simplest solution, because you don't need to eat meat. Um, if you have a walnut every once and again, or maybe some flaxseed, you can live to 100. So if food is merely fuel for you, um, in order to deliver energy to do other things that make your life worth living, then please, by all means, stop eating meat today. But if you're a bit more like me, and if food and cooking and eating is meaningful in your life, if the bounties of nature and the beautiful things that great chefs do with that is what, makes, what, what gives joy to you in your life, then, well, there's just one other option, and that is eat less meat. And I mean radically less meat, not a kilo less than we did last year, but once a week, maybe twice, if you have something to celebrate. Now, this requires a totally new mindset. And the first step towards your new mindset is eating more meat. Now, how is this going to help? Let me explain. While we all agree that the practices of factory farming are absolutely horrific, you still buy meat at your supermarket, right? You still order a hamburger without as much as thinking of asking where it was sourced. And that is because when you think of meat, you think of this instead of this. Um, this is me just uh, last summer, holding a chicken for the first time in my life. I'm 33 years old now, and only this year I tasted an egg fresh that was laid that very morning. When you grow up in a city like most of us do, there's no confrontation whatsoever with any of the steps involved in getting your meat to the supermarket. You can live through 100, providing you eat that occasional walnut, and, and never see a farm or a slaughterhouse or even a carcass. Well, meat is just there, in a styrofoam container, cheap and available. So no wonder you don't think of chickens collapsing under their own waste or the fecal tsunami that accompanies your pork chop. Well, obviously, when I say eating more meat, I don't mean eating more kilos of meat. What I mean is eating the entire animal, eating from nose to tail. Nose to tail eating, what, what does that mean? Um, simply put, 
if you take the life of an animal in order to eat it, then do that respectfully and have the decency to use everything on that animal. Well, I cannot talk about nose to tail eating without at least mentioning Fergus Henderson. He is the uh, incredible chef and founder of St. John Restaurant in London. Um, Henderson is not a ideologist set out to change the world. He merely states that, that it would be disingenuous to the animal not to make the most of the whole beast. And this is foremost just because he's really fond of the, all the delights which lie beyond the fillet, as he puts it. Um, I had the honor to intern one day at St. John restaurant. And I must say, there is no kitchen where they prepare dead animals with more respect. They try to get it in in one piece, butcher it themselves as much as possible. They know exactly where it came from, and uh, they have a, a good relationship with the farmer. Uh, one of the most laborious things I had to do that day was cut out a trekkie of pig lungs. They literally use everything. And this also goes for the leaves of the kohlrabi and the radishes. So, um, maybe unintentionally, with this philosophy, Fergus Henderson became sort of the standard bearer for a culinary movement. His, his book, The Nose to Tail Cookbook, has been called the Ulysses of the Slow Food Movement. But in any case, well, he did a lot to refamiliarize a greater audience with fantastic dishes made with offal and other lesser cuts, uh, most notably his roast uh, bone marrow with parsley salads, which is world famous. Um, of course, he didn't invent nose-to-tail eating. I mean, people have done it for ages um, all around the world out of necessity. We've come up with the most delectable ways to, to preserve meat and use up all the offal from blood sausage to cured ham to a liver pate. Um, this was, for a very long time, absolutely vital to survive winter. You'd be crazy not to use everything, but since then we've, come, we've become uh, removed far from that. So, um, yeah, when I say you need to start eating nose to tail, obviously I don't mean you have to spend next Sunday with the children dismembering a pig in the backyard. <laughs> what, I, what I'm asking you to do is find an old-fashioned butcher in your neighborhood, one that butchers himself, and, and go and talk to him or her and, and ask them for something other than a beef fillet or chicken breast for a change. This is not only going to improve the life of so many farm animals, but it is also, and this is the best part, it's going to make your life so much better, because you are missing out on so many good things. I mean, sure, um, a chicken breast or, or a beef tenderloin requires very little chewing, but that's really all I've got to say for it, because it's probably the least tasty part of the whole animal. And this all has to do with the intensity with which the animal uses um, its muscles. A muscle which is meant to do heavy, protracted work has a different chemical makeup from a muscle that is used for slow and quick movements. And now this chemical makeup makes um, a, um, a hard-working muscle darker, but also a lot tastier. Now, chicken doesn't fly. Um, so it uses its breast muscle um, occasionally only to flap its wings when it's aggravated. It does, however, stand around all day. So that's why the thigh and the drumstick are darker and tastier than the breast. Still, standing around all day is a lot less work than flying miles on end for your winter migration. That's why the breast of a duck or a goose is, again, much, much darker than the uh, chicken leg. Now, the problem with real heavy work is that the muscle has to be really strong and firm. So hard work requires connective tissue. A cow stands around all day grazing, so the front legs, the shoulder and the neck, they have to support this very heavy head, making it go up and down. Therefore, the, the meat of the, of the front end of the cow is super tasty, but it's also far too tough to cook as a steak. Now, when you're looking for a steak to, tr to, to fry, then, then the trick is to find the perfect balance between taste and tenderness, and that lies right in the middle. It's the onglet, or the hanger steak. This is the muscle that makes the lungs go back and forth, sucking in air, letting it out. Now, if the cow stops breathing, it dies. So this muscle works continuously, day and night. Therefore, it's super, super tasty. But lungs are filled with air, which weighs next to nothing. So, relatively, it requires very little connective tissue. So you can, you can fry this up, you can leave it medium rare. You don't need to to brace this. 
We call that in Holland, we call it the butcher's cut, because they used to keep that for themselves. Um, but if you have the time, please, by all means, brace. I mean, brace a shoulder or, or a cheek or, or a whole head. I mean, the, all the tasty morsels that come off of this with a little bit of the broth, it makes fantastic terrine. Now look at this brisket. It's been slowly smoked for hours, and look at the, all the shiny stuff on it. That's the melted away collagen. Now think of that gelatinous, savory film in your mouth. Do you taste it? Now look at this again. This is bone marrow. This is pure taste. You know what else is tasty? Fat. Fat is actually what you want. Fat is the energy storage material, but it's also the perfect medium for aroma molecules. So all the aromas that make shrubs and herbs and, and grass taste and smell so nice, all these aromas are captured in the stored fat of the animal that ate them. And this is what makes your steak tasty. You don't want this. You want it to look like this. Now, look at the pork belly. Look at this. Look at all the perfect layers of meat and fat and meat and fat on top of each other. And then, and then that crispy skin. This is a balance of flavor and textures that that chefs look for in, in a dish. They go great lengths, and it's already there. It's prefab in the pig. Now, my point is, try these things. Eat an ear, cook a knuckle. I mean, there's so much to enjoy. And now, simultaneously, two things are going to happen. First, by eating your way through the whole animal, you're putting back together the pieces of the puzzle. No, but meat is not just a piece of meat. Meat is part of something bigger. And once you see the whole animal, you'll see the bigger picture. You'll start to care. And you'll start to realize that you won't, don't want to feed your children sick, deformed, shit-infused chicken just because it's cheap. But secondly, and more importantly, um, once you've tasted the sweet, nutty flavor of an Iberico pig, one that has roamed freely through the hills of Spain, feeding only on the most tasty acorns it can find, once you've tasted a piece of pork that was so pure you could almost eat it raw, well, then this bleak supermarket chicken ain't gonna cut it anymore. Seriously, tofu is gonna taste just as fine Monday through Friday. No, seriously, if, knowing that on Saturday you have the time and money to braise a beautiful pork shoulder or, or roast a big piece of Côte de Boeuf. And this, this is how it should be. Now meat is a treat. It's like a good bottle of red wine waiting for a, a special occasion. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how we are going to eat less meat. Thank you. Are you, um, are you up for it? Is anyone, has anyone convinced? Is anyone up for trying something new? Yeah? Yeah, yeah, because I didn't bring my friend Fred here just for show. I mean, he's available. I've got recipes for you. You can email Twitter or, or, or even telephone me tomorrow if, if, if you want. Um, raise your hand. Who wants to take it home? Yes? Okay. You. I'll see you after the show. You can have it. Yes? Thank you.